Good morning. Okay, this is uh, scientific session one. Um, our first talk is going to be um, open and laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair in children uh, regional experience presented by uh, Nadia Safa from Montreal Children's Hospital, Quebec. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present our work today. Uh, we have nothing to disclose. Uh, inguinal hernia repair is one of the most common operations performed by pediatric surgeons. Traditionally, the gold standard for repair is really the open approach with a high ligation of the, uh, of the inguinal hernia sac. Um, but laparoscopy has been gaining popularity. Uh, the benefits include a minimal dissection of the vas deferens or testicular vessels, and by the same token, a decreased risk of injuring those cord structures, as well as the ability to assess uh, the contralateral patent processes vaginalis. However, um, hernia recurrence is really the most common complication of inguinal hernia repair, and the range reported in the literature is about 0.3 to 10.9 percent. But there are a lot of variations in different laparoscopic techniques that have been described for laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair in the pediatric population. And for these reasons, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the studies comparing hernia recurrence between laparoscopic and open repairs. And so for this reason, we sought to look at our regional outcomes in Montreal and compare the incidence of hernia recurrence between open and laparoscopic surgical techniques, as well as other post-operative complications following uh, laparoscopic and open inguinal hernia repair, including metachronous contralateral hernias. So we conducted a multicenter retrospective cohort study of all patients less than 14 years old undergoing primary inguinal hernia repair within a five-year study period at two tertiary pediatric surgical centers in Montreal. Although there are many different laparoscopic techniques utilized for laparoscopic repair of pediatric inguinal hernias, uniquely at these two centers, the laparoscopic technique utilized by all the surgeons who performed laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs was the subcutaneous endoscopically assisted ligation technique, or the SEAL technique illustrated here. In terms of our uh, patient and operative characteristics, we had a total of 1,900, a little over 1,900 patients included in the study, with about 2,305 hernias repaired, both by open and laparoscopic techniques at both centers. Uh, in total, 1,827 hernias were repaired by the open technique, and 478 hernias were repaired by laparoscopy. The majority of the patients in the study cohort were male, and out of all of the patients, about 20% of the entire study cohort were ex-premature. Importantly, the operative time for unilateral uh, inguinal hernia repair in the open group was significantly shorter, but when looking at patients who had bilateral, opening, bilateral inguinal hernia repairs, the operative time did not differ significantly between the two techniques. In terms of our clinical outcomes, hernia recurrence did occur in about 0.9% of patients that underwent the open technique. But strikingly, it did occur in 9% of patients that underwent the laparoscopic technique. This was statistically significantly different between the two groups. In terms of metachronous contralateral hernias, there was really a, a minimal difference clinically, but there was a statistically significant uh, difference between the two techniques with laparoscopy showing a lower likelihood of metachronous contralateral hernia. And importantly, other postoperative complications did not differ between the two groups except for surgical site infection, which seemed to have occurred more often in patients who underwent laparoscopic hernia repairs. A Cox regression analysis was then performed to adjust for confounding factors, and laparoscopy did show that it was associated with a higher incidence of hernia recurrence. Importantly, none of the other variables that were adjusted for showed an independent association with hernia recurrence. When we look at time to hernia recurrence, most of the hernias recurred uh, in the cohort less than a year after primary repair, with the median time to recurrence being about 8.2 months. Um, when we did the same analysis but looking at metachronous contralateral hernias, there didn't seem to be any difference between uh, laparoscopy and open approaches. And this is a table finally showing uh, the proportion of hernia recurrence per year over the study period. And when you look at all hernias or just the laparoscopic hernias, there didn't seem to be a change in proportion of hernia recurrence over time. The study's strength really lies in its setting in that we included two tertiary pediatric institutions serving a large defined 
region, um, which enabled us to include a large cohort of pediatric patients with minimal loss to follow up. Uh, however, the limit, there are limitations of this study, of course. Um, although all surgeons did adopt the same SEAL technique, the timing of the adoption of this technique did vary amongst all of the surgeons in the five-year study period, and individual surgeon effects may have definitely contributed to the uh, higher than uh, expected recurrence rate that we're reporting. In conclusion, laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair resulted in a modest decrease in the incidence of metachronous hernia at the cost of a significant increase in recurrence. And our takeaway message really from this study is that we believe that there is quite a heterogeneous reporting of, uh, of hernia recurrence in the current literature. Um, and so we believe it's important to really reflect and look at our own group's uh, recurrence rate when quoting recurrence rates to patients and having these consent discussions. Um, and with that, I will take your questions. Thank you all for your time. Hey, Ben, uh, Sunday, husband from Boston Jones. Hi. A couple of technical questions. Does the SEAL technique that you use employ burning the, the peritoneum or the sac, the hernia sac? It wasn't clear with the pictures. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so I think initially, at the time of the initial adoption of the technique, I don't think we were doing peritoneal burning. I think it was adopted slowly by some of the surgeons, and the data was really too granular to be able to, to analyze that as part of our study. Um, but I think some surgeons did definitely end up using the burning technique later on and adopting it. And the other, in terms of technical questions to address, is uh, they started doing double passes as well uh, later on. Uh, as they noticed that they were having more hernia recurrences too. The other question, technically, were, when you're doing the open repairs, were you doing a contralateral laparoscopic groin exploration through the hernia sac? Um, there, uh, in remembering looking at the data myself, there were about maybe four or five patients that had a diagnostic laparoscopy before, so that was not really, uh, the numbers weren't high enough to be able to include that as part of the analysis. Thanks. Yeah. Brad Warner, St. Louis. Congratulations, I really appreciate this presentation. Thank it you. seems like there's not real equipoise here, though, in really the interpretation of the results. You are looking at a new technique to address something that we do very, very frequently in a short period of time that's an outpatient sort of thing with very low morbidity, and looking at a tenfold increase in recurrence. So why continue to offer it? Why continue to try to make it half of that. It's still higher, but what's the rationale for that? I, I really appreciate the study, and, and I think the technology and, and everything that's being done laparoscopically is tremendous. The visualization is great, and, and we're going to get better. There's no question about it, but what's the rationale for that? I think it's important to reflect on something that's really important in laparoscopy, which is learning curve. Um, we really wanted to have a good follow-up period for the study to be able to capture whether or not patients had recurrences and other complications, but we also wanted to make sure that we were capturing enough of the surgeons being able to adopt this technique. And so I think there's always a balance. You know, I think if we performed this study now, perhaps our recurrence rate would be lower, but we wouldn't have had enough of a follow-up period to be able to see that. So I think learning curve is really important to, to discuss amongst groups that are trying to adopt new surgical techniques. And so our reflection here, what we're really hoping to show is that we're trying to reflect on our own numbers early on as we're adopting this new technique. I think that what this also adds in terms of why are we still doing laparoscopy, I think number one, it can really clarify patient selection for certain procedures, and number two, it can also offer a much uh, more honest discussion with families. And one thing that we didn't include in this, just given the retrospective nature of the study design, was really having patient um, satisfaction, patient cosmetic satisfaction, patient post-operative pain scores, things like that that might have actually mattered more to parents than whether or not they might have had a 10% versus a 1% chance of recurrence. And that's something that, you know, we have to discuss openly and honestly with, with patients and parents when we're having those kinds of consent discussions. So I think there's still room to grow in laparoscopy and adopting these techniques, but this was really our, our chance to kind of reflect and look at our own recurrence rates in that time. Quick. I'm Ron Corpus Christi. Uh, you, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned the uh, vas deferens injury uh, as one of the outcomes. How did you assess that? And would this be a better procedure in patients who are smaller who already have a higher recurrence rate? 
Thank you for your question. Um, so really, the only way we were able to assess that is um, by looking, I was able to look at the hospital records, and these patients presented either in the emergency department or to clinic with, with, a, with a problem like that. And so that's how we were able to capture that kind of complication. I think uniquely in Montreal, we captured these two centers. These patients don't really go anywhere else for their follow-ups. and These are the only two pediatric centers that they would go to, and that's why we were able to really kind of showcase that as a, as a complication. Thank you very much. Uh, we've Thank got you. one more question oh. in the oh, virtual sorry. chat. So. Oh. Uh, real quick, um, is there a higher incidence of hydrocele? And uh, this is from Ayman Al Jaziri. Uh, very good question. Um, I know I didn't, I don't think I included it in the table here, but no, there was no significant difference in, in hydrocele between, between the two groups. The numbers were actually quite low for that. Thank you.